section 1.61, we're going to talk about limits of functions of a continuous variable. There are different kinds of limits that we have studied so far. The first kind is the most uh, obvious one is uh, if you have a function f and x, and x is approaching a point in uh, x0 and you're trying to figure out what where f is approaching. So that is the most common one and that's called x, x consider x as a continuous variable. However, there are other kinds of limits, for example, limits of sequences. If you have a sequence of numbers and they might infinite sequence and they might approach a limit if you take the limit of it. And of course, the third limit that we have done is the area under the curve. The area under the curve is a quite a different kind of limit because then we slice the area into tiny little slices and then we we when we take the limit we increase the number of slices and at the same time reducing each slice of course and then we have to uh, make that go to infinity in order to come come to uh, the come to calculation of the area so that's a yet a different kind of limit so for we're going to go over each kind of limit more carefully but today we're going to go over the 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 most basic form of limit, which is a function f of a con of a variable x on, in a in some kind of an open or closed neighborhood, that at least contains contains a section of the real axis. The definition of limit, as always, is that given if you the limit of f of x as x approach x zero is equal to a if given epsilon bigger than zero, there exists delta such that f x minus a is less than epsilon whenever x minus x0 is less than delta, but bigger than 0. Now, the bigger than 0 means we don't care what x is at x, what f is at x0, OK? The limit concept only consider the neighborhood of a point where you're approaching. We're getting there, but we're not actually there. We only care about the neighborhood. So bear in mind that. That's why um, sometimes the function itself may not exist at the point, but its limit exists to approaching that point. Now, there's a different kind of limit where function approaches some kind of infinity because the reason is because that the value of that function gets bigger and bigger or a negative infinity, the same principle, but we're only going to talk about the positive one for now. The negative one is exactly the same situation. Is if the function of f, say, become more and more positive, it, to define it, we define it very similar to this, just change some of the wording. That is, given a large number, m, bigger than zero, there exists a delta such that fx will be bigger than m if x is within delta of x0. That is, as x gets closer and closer to x0, f just gets bigger and bigger. And it gets, again, no matter how big you pick a number, f will always be bigger than that. And when that happens, we say the function f is approaching positive infinity. Well, negative infinity is similar. Now, remember that infinity is not a number, OK? So it doesn't fit the. It doesn't, we cannot do the normal stuff we, we do with infinity. It's not a set number, so it doesn't, for example, if you have two functions that equal to infinity, they do not equal to each other. They're just infinity, because this is our definition of what that means. Infinity is a direction. It means it will go without bound. Now let's look at some of the theorems on, uh, on limits. The theorems uh, I'm going to quote are all very, very obvious. For example, let's say f is defined at, uh, around the neighborhood of a, but not necessarily at a itself, okay? And the limit of f exists at a. So in other words, as you approach a, f approach some kind of a value. But f might not even be defined at a, we don't, but we don't care about that necessarily. However, then the, what I'm trying to prove is for a close enough neighborhood of a, fx has to be bigger than zero if the limit itself is bigger than zero. So that, you say, well, in other words, as x gets very close to a, the function, the value of f will approach, will get very close to the value called l, which happens to be positive. That means when you get close enough to it, everything in the neighborhood is also going to be positive. Now, the proof of that is very uh, intuitively obvious. Well, what we do is, let's say l is bigger than zero, OK? Let's say here's zero here. And uh, you say, well, what if L is very, very close to zero, like a billionth of an inch, for example? It doesn't matter. We'll magnify it uh, 10 billion times. So that now it looks like this, OK? At a 10 billion magnification, L is here and zero is here. So we will choose, um, well, whatever. 
we'll choose the epsilon that's very small and then we know that this is epsilon okay that's away from zero we know that when when delta is chose, chosen small enough by this definition every f has to land inside here okay which is positive and that is our proof the actual proof you have to write up the logic very carefully but this is basically the idea is you magnify if you consider it big enough, that is, you choose epsilon small enough, then everything has to land within epsilon, says right here. So then it obviously is positive, because you're picking up epsilon small enough, so they are far away from the zero. So everything is positive, as stated. Now, one of the consequences of this obvious theorem is the next statement is, uh, let's look at this, this thing which comes in handy sometimes, is suppose you have a function f this defined, uh, in the neighborhood of the of a point A, and then uh, and the the derivative happens to be positive. Then, if you have some points x1 and x2, which are like one smaller than A and one's bigger than A, then we will pick a small enough neighborhood such. Uh, then, then this true this fact is true. That is, f of x1 is less than f of A, which is less than f x2. In other words, when your derivative is positive, you have a local line that slopes up a little bit, and therefore locally, very small area at least, in that whole small area, that, that everything to the left is going to be less than A, and every, everything to the right is bigger than A. And that seems intuitively obvious, and we can prove it with this theorem by looking at the definition of, um, of the derivative. Of course, the derivative means that is the limit of, um, let's see, anyway, is f of, um, let's see, how is this written down? Okay, we'll say fx, okay, minus f of a divided by x minus a, okay? This is as x approach a. Now, as we have said before, when it's close enough, this value in here, because this is positive, and when it's close enough, then uh, <clears throat> this whole thing is going to be positive. Okay. Now, if this is positive, then that means when x is bigger than a, f is going to be bigger than f a. And then, and when x is smaller than a, the then f is going to be smaller than f a. In order for this fraction to be eventually bigger than zero, so that's how it comes about. There are a couple other. Um, very obvious theorems about limits, which I will read it to you now, is, uh, for example, suppose you have a bunch of function f, and it's approaching x0, and then every value, as it approaches x0, the f, f of x is less than a certain value m. Okay, everything is less than m. That means the limit will also be less than m, because everything that's going to it is bounded. So the limit is obviously uh, going to be less than m as well, and that's one of the obvious theorems. And another one is called the squeeze principle. That is, if you have three functions, okay, f, g, h, and they, as they uh, approach x0, they all, the say, the top function and the bottom function, each function is bigger than the other. And then you, so you have three functions. One is bigger than the others, like this. For example, um, say we have f, x, and then g, x. and then hx. And they satisfy this inequality within a small neighborhood of what we're thinking of, of x0. So that as in that neighborhood, this is always true, OK? You have three functions, and each one is always bigger than the next on each point of x in that little neighborhood. And what's more, both the least function and the highest function, let's say they all go to a set limit, l. OK, let's say they go to the same thing. This one also go to l. If that is the case, then the middle one has to converge at the limit exists, and it does always it also converge to L as well. And that is also an obvious uh, theorem that we normally call the squeeze principle. It gets squeezed in there that we will quote frequently and just and without really trying to prove it, although the proof is fairly easy as well.